be before you today. I appreciate first your patience in uh, taking uh, some of these agenda items out of order. We do have three separate uh, presentations that we'll have for you, and we, um, as, as the uh, as the chair had noted, that we do have some scheduling conflicts, so we're trying to just uh, accommodate everybody's schedule here. So um, today, uh, first thing I wanted would like to do is to present to you basically why we are interested in doing. Uh, a lease purchase agreement on these parcels here. Um, I have a, a brief presentation from Tom McNair from Ohio City, Inc. He's going to give an overview of the uh, project in general that we're looking to uh, assist with. And um, from there, we'll have some questions specific to the parcels uh, that are uh, um, we're, we're speaking about in the legislation today. So with that being said, Tom, if you could come on up. Also, I'd like to just recognize Councilwoman Conwell has joined us. Uh, good morning, Councilman Tuma, uh, other members of the committee. Uh, my name is Tom McNair. I'm the Executive Director of Ohio City Incorporated, uh, joined here today by Greg Peckham, Executive Director of Land Studio, as well as Ben Trimble, our Senior Director of Real Estate and Planning, uh, who will be available for questions afterwards. Uh, here today to give you a little bit of context on the Irish Town Bend project, which so many of us have been working on uh, for a long time. Uh, this is one of the best civic collaborations that I have seen in my lifetime. There are now over 20 governmental, uh, civic, and nonprofit entities all working to move this forward, uh, but gave you a consolidated uh, a vision of, of what we're trying to accomplish here uh, today. Uh, looking back at Irish Town Bend, it did get its name uh, historically by the fact this was where many of the Irish immigrants came to settle in the city of Cleveland, living in dense housing along the Cuyahoga River uh, where they'd come to work. I mean, that's where you saw places like St. Malachy's, St. Patrick's, uh, St. Coleman's all uh, come on the near west side. Uh, you can see here a picture of West 25th Street, and I think you start to get an understanding of how the hillside itself kind of relates to the neighborhood. You can see the streetcars, uh, which were being put in here in 1917. Uh, that actually also started the process of widening the street and moving some of the structures further back on the hillside, which is one of the problems uh, that we are addressing. Uh, and then you look at, this is a picture here from the 1920s uh, of the Cuyahoga River Channel. What you see highlighted in yellow are the metal bulkheads uh, that line the riverfront. That is one of the core uh, issues that uh, our group has been working to try to figure out a solution for, uh, which we'll talk about in a moment. Uh, and then you see uh, a picture roughly of from today. This is the Ohio City Farm. This is a picture taken from uh, CMHA's Riverview Tower overlooking uh, the river valley. Uh, a lot of what we know and understand about this project today started uh, with the Ohio City Farm. There used to be low-rise public housing there that was torn down for what was going to be a mixed income project uh, on that site. Uh, soil samples were taken and that is when we discovered that the land is actually slowly falling into uh, and moving towards the Cuyahoga River, uh, which is, as you would imagine, a very large problem. Uh, one of the reasons that is such a, a large problem uh, is that the Cuyahoga River represents a $3.5 billion economic industry for our region. There are over 20,000 jobs associated with that ship channel. Uh, through the work that the port has done, uh, um, which uh, they've spent over $500,000 trying to get their arms around the stability issues of the hillside, uh, you know, they have shown us that there's a thing called coefficient of stabilization. Uh, anything lower than one is not even safe for human movement, uh, right? It is what they consider a risk of an imminent collapse. Uh, the area at the northernmost part of Irish Town Bend is a point two. Right? So we know that there is a very serious issue, and that's why uh, so many of us have been coming together uh, around this issue. But uh, you know, ultimately, we, we decided it was best to stop looking at this simply as a challenge, but rather what the opportunities might be uh, if we look at this through kind of a different lens. And so uh, the Port Authority and our organization uh, came together with $20,000 of local match to apply for a NOACA grant of $80,000 to study this as a transportation project. Uh, Land Studio came on board bringing another $25,000 uh, uh, to the project to ensure that we were getting the highest quality design possible. Uh, and you can see here one of the reasons why this is so regionally significant. Uh, this network of trails that is coming online here from the Towpath Trail, uh, uh, the, the Cleveland Foundation Centennial Lakelink Trail, Red Line Greenway, all of which come together and tie in at Irish Town Bend. 
Uh, you can see a, a more close-up version of that right now, how all these things fit together, and ultimately how they can help bring the neighborhood right, and the region to the waterfront. Uh, I'm 42 years old. We have been talking about connecting to the waterfront in this town since I, before I was born, uh, frankly, and I think we have always looked at that as, as a mechanism that we have to get to the lake, uh, but I think we are just starting to discover that we have an amazing riverfront, too. Uh, you can see that just to the south uh, of... Uh, 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 here with uh, you know places like Merwin's Wharf and, and the Rowing Foundation, you're seeing it with Flats East Bank. Uh, but we we had a huge public process around this. There were actually over 500 people engaged over a period of about six months uh, at public meetings. There were countless more. Uh, we even at the uh, when the county had the uh, subway tours, uh, we had stands there letting people know what was going on. Other events throughout the region. Uh, to let people know what we were doing with the idea ultimately that you take these 23 acres uh, of unstable land and take it from uh, something like this uh, with the ability to change it into a 23 acre riverfront park knowing that we have to do the stabilization right that's not an option it is something we have to do but how much of that work is actually laying the groundwork for uh, a park right uh, and so Taking a look at that, the different ways that this begins to connect people to that waterfront, uh, moving them up and down the, the, the hillside, uh, the different transportation options that could come in here. Uh, there are nine bus routes that come right through here, uh, including, as you look at a uh, section of West 25th Street today, uh, we know the Metro Health BRT line, which connects a great asset uh, to the south up through Ohio City and onto Public Square, right? And so the ability to take uh, what is today that really uh, overly wide road, kind of condense it, uh, make it function better into something like this uh, that, again, works better for the bus transit that would be coming here uh, and begin to take uh, pieces of the hillside which people have not seen and engaged with in a number of years from scenes like this into potentially something like this. Um, also creating, uh, you know, riverfront boardwalk access and experiences similar to what you might see here. Um, and so, again, we have spent the better part of the last year uh, working on this vision. It was adopted by the Cleveland City Planning Commission on September 1st of last year. Um, but there have been a whole lot of other things that are very important as it goes with this. When, when our coalition came together and started working on this, we knew that there were uh, really three main components that we had to move forward if we were going to actually make any progress on this. Uh, the first of which is that we knew that we needed a vision that would inspire people. Uh, that is, uh, you know, you saw the very condensed version of that uh, just now, uh, and that has been adopted and we're moving forward. Uh, secondly, we knew that, like I said, first and foremost, this is a stabilization project, and we needed to make sure that we were raising the funds necessary uh, to keep that catastrophic collapse from, from uh, happening and to ensure uh, that the, the hillside was getting stabilized. Uh, within the past year, our group has secured over $13 million in commitments. Uh, we are up for a federal infra grant uh, with NOACA has applied for that we will find out in June that would expand that number to about $22.5 million. So we've made substantial progress on that. Uh, and then finally, you know, the reason, frankly, that we are here today is because we realize that absolutely none of this would be possible uh, without having domain and ownership of the hillside. Um, there are 24 different parcels on this hillside. Uh, one of the things that has always plugged or plagued Irish Town Bend uh, is the fact that you had people that, uh, you know, whenever we talked about this, they'd get in a room, they'd point a bunch of fingers at each other, and the lawyers would get involved, talk about how much money everyone owed. Uh, we tried to de-escalate that situation, start working with property owners, and say, how can we work together to get this done? Uh, Cuyahoga County represents two of the parcels of those 24. Uh, if you agreed to convey this land, we will now have 22 of those uh, in, 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 in our holding, uh, which is a fairly amazing amount of progress in the last year. Uh, we've had people straight up donate them. We've worked, uh, Land Studio worked very hard to get a $1.4 million Clean Ohio grant uh, to get the, money, the land from Cuyahoga Metropolitan Housing Authority. Um, so it has been an amazing uh, uh, group of people coming together to really move forward something I think that can be regionally significant. Uh, and we can't do it without the help and partnership of people like Cuyahoga County. And so uh, we ask for your support in conveying this land uh, because it's a very important piece uh, that could be a gateway uh, into the hillside from the northern end. So uh, thank you. And like I said, we've got other members of our team if you have questions. Okay. All right. Thank you. <clears throat> Uh, 
Okay, thank you. That, so that was the overview of what the project is and, and what the intent is. So the two parcels in question, uh, John Myers, our real estate, uh, from our real estate group, is here to kind of give a little bit more overview of the respective parcels. Okay. Thank you, Director. Good morning, members of council committee. Uh, the map that was handed to you just gives you a visual here so you can orient yourself as to the t these two parcels to have you process this decision uh, and opportunity presented to you today. These parcels were acquired uh, uh, many years ago. In fact, uh, we're celebrating the centenary of the, of the Veterans Memorial Bridge this year in 2018. These uh, parcels were acquired as part of that project uh, back then and, um, and have been ancillary to the care and maintenance and building of, of that bridge. Um, they um, are extraneous to our continued needs and have worked out a relationship with uh, uh, the end use that would uh, provide for any potential use uh, that we may need related to the bridge. Um, so the opportunity here is to be a partner in this project. Uh, the economics of it, frankly, are uh, um, symbolic in that it's a dollar a year lease for these two um, parcels uh, for t uh, initial term of 25 years with two 25-year terms renewable and the ability to purchase uh, the um, property at some point should consolidation or be beneficial to both projects. Uh, the caveat being that that purchase could not be an option by the, the park uh, group until substantial progress is made. So God forbid if this doesn't get off the ground, which uh, looks like it definitely is, the county's protected that uh, we would still hold on to this unless there's essentially substantial progress made towards the um, building of this park. Okay. okay. Uh, will you guys be able to take any qu questions sure, now? Sure. Okay. All right. Um, <clears throat> Ms. Conwell. So um, to the chair to uh, Mr. Myers, you just stated if we have the ability if nothing is built on it. So what happens if not, if the park isn't built? I mean, I, I, to my understanding, I thought we were just leasing it. We're still going to have an easement and access, or are we actually turning it over to, to the conservatory? Well, it will be under their control pursuant to this lease, but we wouldn't permanently alienate the or dispose of the land unless the park becomes a reality, essentially. So when I think the phraseology is substantial completion um, towards, towards this that uh, would be the trigger before the group could actually consider purchasing this property. Okay, but we would still maintain access for the bridge, correct? Uh, yes, to, for, for maintenance, even though that's largely under um, ODOT and city involvement right now is, is, are the primary groups involved in the care and maintenance of that bridge. Okay, a uh, quick question as, as to the lease itself. Um, does the uh, county have the ability to renew the lease or is it only on them to re renew or is it? I believe it's an option in their, in their cho choice. It's an option of theirs. It's an option of theirs, okay. Yes, it's, it's an option of the tenant. Okay, Mr. Sean. And once they uh, are able to, to bind all the par parcels together and then they can turn uh, get a fee simple ownership of that piece of property at some point along the way. What constraints are, are there in uh, regards to using it for other purposes other than a park? Is our deed going to have a constraint, a restriction in regards to that? At that time, we would have an additional document of transfer of actual fee ownership that that, that matter would be um, addressed, but it's in, I believe, um, I'm not sure, I don't have the language in front of me, in perpetuity though, for purposes of the park. Okay, but it could not be used as residential or commercial or anything of that nature, can be converted and flipped to, to, to a secondary purpose? Correct, that's, uh, that's limited to park use. Okay, and the stabilization uh, in the event that this does not stabilize, uh, what responsibility, if any, do we have uh, as the uh, because uh, we're, we're still going to be the landowner uh, under this lease, I assume. 
So responsibility in regards to what? The should the land say, yeah, should the land fail? Um, yeah, well, it, the land failure is, is really farther down right. um, from away from our parcels. So the, the issue is, uh, and if I could, if I'm not mistaken here from Tom McNair, that the, the bulkhead work is taking place uh, further to the south. So uh, the failure is not happening close to the bridge. So it's not impacting our project, our, our parcels. Okay, so you, you you have no worries that we'll ever have to be stepping up and, and helping su to support that uh, because it's if, if, if it fails at the bottom, then it's going to start failing uh, on, right. on up further. The well, the responsibility ultimately for the bridge is falls back on ODOT in the okay. city. So the major maintenance responsibilities, that would come back to ODOT. And they do have a small project that's going to be taking place to take care of some... Um, there's some water infiltration issues on the south side of the bridge, and, and they're formulating a plan to address that right now. And, and the intent is always to have the commercial traffic for the steel and support going through this bend? Is that, there's no desire to, to, to cut this whole thing off and make a faster port uh, activity? I've seen some designs where, uh, where you're going to cut that whole bend off and make it into a two mile or less trip for the steel. Is, is, uh, it just seems to me that this is, we're, we're continually asking a burden of the, of the heavy duty ships and things like that to be, to be creating a, a problem in that channel as opposed to really, really, really addressing the problem that should have been done 150 years ago when we all talked, to, well, no, we didn't, but groups before us talked about straightening the river out. Um, that is not uh, a part of this. I, I know that the city of Cleveland did give legal authority to the port uh, of Cleveland to maintain the ship channel. Uh, that is not something that they are currently entertaining. Man, it's just, just this just seems to be backwards. I'm sorry, but it just the, when you could make a small cut in the river and get and and save an hour and a half to two hours worth of every ship going up there, and if steel is going to be part of our of our culture uh, just seems to me that we are not doing anything to address making steel more efficient and more effective by, by doing this. Okay, disappointment. Thank you, Mr. Schron. Um, uh, Ms. Baker. Thank you. Um, just to get a, a understanding, there are, did you say 23 acres? Uh, it's a total of 23 acres, I believe, is the overall project, yes. And what is our acreage that we are leasing? Uh, I believe it's, a, right I think it's, I, I'm sorry, I don't have that exact. I think it's just under two acres. Two right acres. So yeah. It's two miles every single day. The, and, and that's both parcels. That's two correct. acres. So an acre maybe each. I, I'll get that exact number okay. for you, okay? The, um, the two, if we were, if I did hear you correctly, okay. if we were to um, allow this lease today, mm -hmm. we would be up to 22 and we need two more to complete it. I heard that. So are the two holdouts, are they significantly located in this area that would be uh, difficult for us to move ahead? Uh, the last two parcels that uh, would be remaining in on, on this are both at the top of the hillside, uh, you know, one of which is uh, front steps. Uh, you know, they... they uh, Formerly transitional housing, they used to house only battered women. Now they're a permanent supportive housing that is uh, non-gender specific. Uh, they very much would like to vacate the hillside. Uh, again, the stability issues, I think, on this are really well documented. There's been a lot of money. Uh, if you step behind Front Steps building, you'll see there's an elevation drop of about 20 feet from mm -hmm. their parking lot yeah. from where it used to be to where it is today. Uh, they are currently looking at a new location further down West 25th Street. Uh, our organization has been assisting them with that, as has the council person, uh, and they are hopeful that they'll receive low-income housing tax credits later on this year uh, that would enable them to move, so they've been very actively involved. Uh, yeah. The last property owner is the one adjacent to you. Uh, you know, he and, and that is one we have worked with every single property owner to try to find a solution. Uh, ultimately, when we first started looking at stabilization, uh, on this, I think the port factored in for leaving all the remaining buildings at the top of the hillside, though certainly it is more efficient if they are not there, um, but they can be worked around. There are some additional costs with that. Um, as we had told all the property owners at the beginning, uh, up top, obviously our goal of creating access to the riverfront uh, requires that. We've obtained a substantial amount of it. 
uh, while we do not feel uh, through all the work that we've done that redevelopment is possible on the hillside because mm -hmm. of the stability issues, uh, if one wanted to reuse one of those buildings, that is certainly, I think, a possibility. Uh, so we will continue to work with the property owners best we can. But we do feel that we have enough of the properties in play that with this coming on board, we could move forward with the project. And if I did, if I may, if I did hear correctly also, there is no other development to entice people to come to these parks, ice cream shops. No, um, not, not at this time. Like I, there was the idea of potentially having a small kind of uh, 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 kind of entry plaza type area where there could be amenities such as that. Um, you know, but ultimately, again, creating a civic amenity like this, we think has huge ripple effects uh, broader in the neighborhood, right? Uh, we did a study that showed that re the immediately adjacent real estate values would increase by over $4 million. Uh, when this comes online, that does not take a look at the broader impact uh, of the neighborhood surrounding it, right? Um, but no, that you know, again, this has been an age-old question in Ohio City is whether or not this could be a civic amenity for the people and enjoyment. Uh, and again, well, this would be potentially the, the first public housing project in the United States of America that is directly connected to a public waterfront park, uh, which is which is pretty special, I think. Um, but the age-old question has been, is this a hillside for development or a hillside for a public amenity? Uh, and we believe we've answered that question. The grant that Land Studio got uh, for Clean Ohio actually deed restricts all the land that is part of that, uh, that it can only be green space into perpetuity. So mm. uh, that question has been answered. And if I may, lastly, um, your timeline, if this were be to approve, it looks like you've got most, if not all, except for one property. What type of timeline are you looking at? Uh, our group has not uh, not allowed ourselves to get bogged down in the enormity of this. We've taken the approach of one step over the other, and that's how I think we've made so much progress in the last year. Uh, like I said, there has been a substantial uh, amount of money that has been secured in commitments for the bulkhead work, which is the most important of that. That will begin, whether it is with the $13 million or the 22 and a half, if we're fortunate enough to get that to federal infra grant, that will begin probably in early 2019. Uh, that is very important. We've also been working very closely with the city of Cleveland because uh, one of the important parts is actually relocating Franklin Boulevard. Uh, that is a project that is lining up for 2020. Both of those things have to happen before anything else can move forward. Uh, and it's important because there's all, there's other dollars that are already associated with this. Uh, you know, the Metro Park mm -hmm. secured uh, that $8 million federal tiger grant to move a lot of the trail progress forward. Uh, they also got a $3.3 .3 million CMAC grant from NOACA for what would be the portion of the Lake Link Trail that comes through this. The bulkheads and Franklin have to be a real to do that that's 2021 so 2021 okay. is the date we're kind of working with okay. um, but it's obviously all fluid it's good to know thank you yeah. miss conwell through the chair to mr mcnair um this area has uh, had um, individuals staying under the bridges can you please elaborate for the committee on uh, what the progress is and relocating those individuals that are living under the bridge. Okay. Absolutely. Uh, thank you, Councilwoman. That's a great question. Uh, you know, it, it's funny as uh, you look at issues around equity. Uh, like I said, I think for a long time we were very concerned about, you know, this is a tremendous amenity and would be the first waterfront park in the United States directly connected to public housing. We worked uh, very closely with residents of Riverview to make sure that they were you know, part of the planning process. Uh, but the further you peel that back, you realize that there are many layers uh, to equity. Uh, and there are seasonally adjusted anywhere between about 10 and 35 individuals who reside uh, on that hillside. And so, uh, again, I mentioned the large amount of, of collaboration that is going on here. Uh, several of uh, uh, the entities that are working on this, Northeast Ohio Coalition from the Homeless, Frontline Services, uh, Adams Board, uh, you know, all coming together to uh, work with those individuals. Uh, in the past year, we have already relocated uh, you know, through our partners there, over 20 of those individuals to permanent supportive housing. Um, there are about five remaining at the moment uh, that don't want to go into permanent supportive housing, and we have been working with the consortium to find individualized plans to help them move along. Okay. Any further questions from members of the committee on this? Okay, and with that, um, Obviously, this is an ongoing project. So uh, what are we looking at as far as moving this forward with the council? Yeah, we're fine to go forward with three readings. We're okay. finalizing some survey detail for the contract, for the okay. agreement. So third reading adoption would be.
Great. Okay. I, with that, if there are no further questions, um, I'll make a motion to move this along for um, second reading. Second. Okay. We have a motion and a second to move this uh, 2018-0081 to second reading uh, in, front of count, uh, in front of committee. Um, any f further discussion with that? Uh, okay. I have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed nay. Ayes have it. Mr. Chairman, I like my name at it. And we will add <coughs> Ms. Uh, Conwell's name to this, please. It thank is you. in her district. All right. Thank you. Um, Madam Clerk, uh, item number two, I believe we're doing uh, 0086, right? Resolution number 2018-0086, making awards of requisition number 39869 to various providers, each in the amount not to exceed $300,000 for general engineering services for the period, excuse me, 4-2-2018 through 4-21-2021. Okay. Um, and uh, Ms. English, uh, if you could, well, I was going to say if you could state your name, but I just <laughs> did, so um, we know you're on a little timeline here, so if Thanks. you could explain this resolution. Sure, Nicole English from Public Works. So we're awarding our um, annual general engineering services contract to two vendors. Um, HNTB was the top ranking scorer, and then Chagrin Valley Engineering was the top ranking SBE firm. One of these it was an SBE set aside um, through our SBE set aside program. There was um, 46 RFQs pulled, 15 submitted for review, and the two were selected. They each are 300,000 because the combined total is more than 500 is why we're bringing it to council. Okay. Um, questions from my colleagues? No? Okay. I think it's pretty, pretty straightforward here. Um, and uh, I see the time frame here. Um, trying to move this along here. That's... It would be appreciated, to. yeah, if we could get them get it through so we could start working. These okay. contracts typically do um, our smaller roadway resurfacing designs, any surveying needs that we have. So we have a couple projects lined up that we want them to start working on as soon as the contract is okay. approved. All right. And with that, uh, could I have a motion for um, uh, second reading suspension? So moved. Okay. I have a motion and a, sec and a second for second reading suspension. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay. The ayes have it. Okay. Thank you. Resolution number 2018-0085, authorizing an amendment to an agreement with Cuyahoga County District Board of Health for acquisition and maintenance of a permanent facility for the period 1-1-2004 through 12-31-2023 to change the scope and the terms effective 2-1-2018 to extend the time period to 12-31-2038 and for additional funds. Okay. Good morning, uh, Mr. Chairman. Again, Michael Dever with Department of Public Works. We have a brief presentation from the Board of Health. All right. And then uh, we'll have um, uh, some information in regards to the uh, item that's on the agenda. Okay, uh -oh. great. The computer's gone down. All right. Well, let's try to take care of the technical difficulty. Yeah. I wonder, should we try and... Oh, it's starting back up. Okay. Thanks for your patience. No problem. Thank you, Jim. Okay. There we go. Very good. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of council. Uh, my name is Terry Allen. I'm a health commissioner at the Cuyahoga County Health Department. With me today is our board president, uh, Debbie Moss, and our finance committee chair from the board, Doug Wang. Um, today, uh, we want to talk to you a little bit about a project that we are currently uh, in the middle of at the Board of Health and ask for your support uh, in, in sharing uh, some of the uh, costs with us as we move forward. So the, for a background, we'll, uh, some may not be familiar with the Board of Health and, and what we do, so we'll give a brief, a very brief overview of what we do. Uh, talk about the existing agreement that we have uh, uh, with the county that began in 2003, the purpose and description of our space project activities, and the, the purpose of the extension request. So the, the Cuyahoga County Board of Health serves as the general health district for Cuyahoga County. We serve 50 
eight communities in the county. The city of Cleveland has its own health department. Last year, uh, Shaker joined our health district. We serve uh, almost 885,000 residents. The health departments uh, across the, the state of Ohio, general health districts started in 1918 uh, following the Spanish flu pandemic. And so most of our uh, structures were uh, born in 1919, which is when we, we began. So uh, we also have some uh, responsibilities countywide. Uh, we do uh, related to infant mortality prevention, newborn home visiting. Uh, we uh, have a five county responsibility around emergency preparedness. We have a nine county breast and cervical cancer screening grant, and we have a, a six county responsibility around Ryan White, um, uh, uh, Part A Ryan White grant. So uh, this is our, uh, our uh, organizational chart, and I'll sort of walk you through the components to give you a sense of who we are quickly. So uh, our District Advisory Council, and this is from 1919 Ohio law, is comprised of village and township mayors along with the county executive, and they appoint our board to five-year terms that are staggered. And also um, they, uh, they uh, approve the contracts we have with our 38 communities, and, and we have a 21 uh, general health district village and township component as well that uh, reaches our, our number of um, 58. Uh, the, the Board of Health, uh, has, uh, in, uh, Mr. Wang and Ms. Moss are our members. Uh, they appoint the health commissioner, that's me, and also our medical director. Prevention and wellness is an arm where we do quite a bit of work around what you would view as nursing and community health services. So we do vaccinations. We have a clinic on site. Uh, we uh, flu pneumonia vaccination, childhood vaccinations. Uh, we also do um, a family planning clinic on site and have a number of satellite clinics. Uh, we, we have, a, as I mentioned, the breast cervical cancer screening grant and treatment, which uh, serves folks who do not have, are not insured. We, uh, the Ryan White uh, program serves folks who are living with HIV and AIDS. Uh, we do a lot of uh, child care education and, and work around uh, child wellness in um, child care centers like Starting Point. We do some school health work. Uh, a whole range of maternal and child health uh, supportive programs. As I mentioned, pregnancy prevention and family planning. We do a lot of work <coughs> on healthy eating and active living, tobacco prevention, things along those lines. In environmental public health services, there are still, uh, believe it or not, about 8,000 septic systems uh, in this county. And so we're in charge of assessing those systems and determining whether they're functional, testing uh, uh, tributaries to look at whether whether the systems are, the effluent is safe, and then requiring as necessary the replacement of those systems or, or to work with communities around uh, sewering. So that's a, a responsibility that we work very closely with Public Works on. We do uh, 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 inspect 5,000 uh, restaurants and grocery stores for food protection, respond to foodborne outbreaks. We, uh, we do some land use related consulting, injury prevention work, and coordinate the countywide opiate task force uh, on behalf of a range of partners. Uh, we um, we uh, have uh, ins inspect your, the pools, the schools. Uh, we do watershed protection, looking at outfalls around the county of uh, during wet and dry events uh, to determine wh what the source is to uh, eliminate cross connections. And we do that for communities in the county and out of county. We enforce the statewide smoke-free law. Um, and so a range of responsibilities uh, uh, dealing with vector control, things like West Nile virus prevention. Epidemiology, surveillance, and informatics uh, is where we do all of our data collection. We do a lot of mapping. We do mapping of things like uh, the location of grocery stores, fast food, uh, uh, vehicle uh, concentration, looking at siting for uh, and making case for support for uh, healthy uh, eating options in neighborhoods. We do a lot of work around mapping life expectancy and a whole range of data on our programmatic activities. We uh, are responsible for emergency preparedness, so the e Ebola situations, H1N1 situations, we're the point public health group on that and work very closely with emergency services. We integrate a lot of data sets and we uh, track a whole range of uh, reportable diseases and respond to disease outbreaks that occur in the community. Clusters of disease identifying the, the clusters, tracking data that comes from hospital systems tracking over-the-counter sales and medications to determine where we're seeing clusters of activity that may be seasonal or otherwise. And, and then we respond to the outbreaks to uh, try to um, uh, tamp down the, the impact and prevent it uh, from happening again. Administration is pretty standard legal, fiscal uh, grants and, and other uh, programmatic activities for payroll. Uh, performance management around uh, 
uh, you know, looking at our quality improvement exercises, human resources, and our communication and marketing. So for the project background, uh, our building's located in Parma. We acquired the site in 2003 off of uh, 100, West 130th near Hummel in Parma Commerce Park. Uh, the idea of the project is we need to look now at where we stand here in going in 2018 here now, what we have in terms of looking at efficiency and flexibility around our, our staffing in the workspace, looking at uh, what we're doing around, uh, around dealing with uh, digitizing a lot of our paper and organizing our space to be most effective for the people we serve and for, for staff. Uh, looking at our conference space, we've had a, a huge influx of use around training. We have free parking, so there's a lot of training that goes on. Uh, first responders, a whole range of coalitions in the community use our space for training, education. Um, we have some ADA compliance issues we need to address. There are some major systems that are at the end of their useful life that need to be replaced. Um, we are also looking at some uh, energy efficiency uh, opportunities here that will uh, provide some cost savings into the future. Public access and security and also uh, ties back to quality of life for staff. So we have a, a roof that's leaking. We have a ventilation system that is past its uh, usable life and needs to be replaced. We need to address the ADA items, ADA items I mentioned. We want to uh, uh, use LED lighting throughout the structure, uh, enhancing the conference space to make it bigger, to have the technology to be able to do web-related uh, interactions across the community, statewide, nationally. Uh, also, uh, for, for general functionality and other meeting spaces in the building, we have some furniture. We have carpet that needs to be replaced, some furniture. Uh, component of the furniture, and the uh, public access and security are, are uh, important uh, components to this, uh, and um, I mentioned about the flexibility of workspaces. Whoops. So our overall sort of uh, large uh, buckets of work is the construction-based contract is about 3.1 million, the uh, HVAC replacement and roof are uh, about 1.5 million. The furniture, light fixture, LED updates, and AV upgrades are about 570,000. And our owner environmental testing and contingency is at about 200,000. So we're projecting about a $5.3 million cost for the work. The work is underway. We uh, began uh, in January. We expect to be done by late summer. Uh, we've worked uh, very closely with the Office of the Executive on the project. We have obtained a 20-year loan uh, through Huntington Bank that uh, extends 20 years till 2038 to pay for the cost of the project. Our extension request before you and our existing agreement extends is currently uh, would expire in 2023 in order to synchronize with our um, uh, with with uh, the loan that we have uh, request today is for you to consider a supporting extension through 2038 to match up with the payment of the loan process to help to share some of the costs. Currently, the agreement that we have provides about $275,000 annually to cover uh, utilities, uh, property maintenance, phones, internet, that sort of thing. And so we'd be sharing costs for what we would foot the bill on uh, tied to uh, paying back the note as well as uh, support that we would continue to receive uh, with your support for this extension uh, to uh, pay back the loan. We would expect that would give us 20 years of life uh, with the building, then it's a good form um, to take us well into the future. So that's my general overview of our work. We have uh, many more specifics uh, uh, available, at, and as mentioned, the project's underway. Um, and uh, I would just ask for your support and consideration and happy to answer any questions you may have. Okay. Um, Ms. Conwell first. Uh, through the chair to uh, the director, <clears throat> going back to the slide, uh, to the uh, pr overview, will you play a role in smoking, uh, smoking at the HUD, HUD buildings? You know, you talked about Board of Health and, and just wondering, that's coming yeah. down the pike. If right, Board of right. Health so I know that that's been important, that there's been a lot of support uh, nationally movement around smoke-free public housing. Uh, there, that needs to be taken in steps. We certainly think it's a good thing. We want to make sure that the supports are in place uh, if, if that is, um, it, it, as that comes to pass. Uh, and we can provide and, 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 and are, are happy to provide support. Uh, with that. At this point, we're not directly involved, but I will make a point of reaching out to uh, the Housing Authority uh, in the process uh, uh, to, uh, to move that along. I would say um, the um, smoke-free law, uh, it's important to note, I think is important. Uh, generally, we have uh, seen a 95% decrease in the um, 
number of complaints that we received for the smoke-free law. Uh, we have seen a 30% post-ban decrease in um, chief complaints at emergency departments for heart attacks, which is very positive. But we need to continue cessation programs. Vaping is an issue that we're seeing now. Little cigars, particularly with um, among uh, African American uh, children, we're seeing an increase in little cigars that are being sold individually. <laughs> Things like Beatty's, Cretex, um, uh, Swisher Sweets. So that's an issue that we're concerned about. But vaping is rising among young kids, creating a nicotine addiction uh, early. And then we're also seeing co use of tobacco. And vaping, and so that this is a big challenge right now. The FDA is looking at regulations tied to, to vaping, which uh, are critical. I think it's important that, uh, as the rules go in place, that there are cessation opportunities for folks, uh, and and that's uh, that's I think an important aspect of what needs to be done. And so I will assure uh, that, assure you that we'll follow up with with CMHA. And that's definitely one of the issues that I wanted to make sure uh, that was covered. You, yeah. Okay. Many of those uh, individuals have uh, mental health issues and things of that that is tied to cigarette smoking, and we don't want anyone losing their housing due to that. So I'm glad you stated that. How many employees are employed for the uh, Board of Health? There are about 150 plus another 15 to 20 seasonal employees. And improvements for public safety includes what? So that was listed in the beginning of your slide. You said there's some improvements. Right, right. <clears throat> So we have uh, we've uh, have some security um, um, access to the building, uh, some extensions, some key card access, some video uh, monitoring extensions that we're putting in place, some controls in the clinic, and at the front desk in terms of uh, uh, security notification that we're putting in place. Those will be tied into the overall uh, uh, greeter system that we're putting in place to to uh, to badge folks as they come in. And you talked about the loan that you took out that you're doing the work already, uh, so. You guys fronted up the cost for all that. So we have already been using our general revenue dollars, and I should also say that according to our revised code that the county uh, is our bank. So you cut our checks and, and, and do that for every county health district in the state. And so, uh, so those funds reside with the county. Um, and uh, so, yes, we're paying out of our general fund, but the, but the, um, the, the uh, loan is... is is uh, the bills are coming in, but the loan is done, and it's we have the dollars in our possession, so we're able to pay uh, using that those loan dollars to pay for the costs, which will be front loaded, of course, okay. as they bill us as we go forward. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Miller. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, Director, uh, my questions are basic and structural in nature. Uh, could you? Uh, Describe what the structural relationship is between uh, between the the county and the health department. To to what extent is the health department a part of the county government, and to what extent is the health department an independent agency? Well, I think uh, that's a good question. I would say that we uh, we have a, a connection uh, that's tied back uh, historically. Revised code talks about the fact that. Uh, we, we, as I mentioned, there's the, the fiscal relationship, um, the, and the county executive does have a, a role in appointing our board members. Um, we do receive uh, uh, some funds for direct service around newborn home visiting. We do some solid waste-related responsibilities. You may recall some of the work that went on at the ARCO project in East Cleveland. We were the point uh, for the remediation of that work. Um, uh, we also do... Uh, uh, child fatality review related uh, work. And so there are a number of, of, of uh, responsibilities around uh, programmatic work. In terms of oversight, we have our board that is uh, appointed through that district advisory council and oversees our day-to-day -day activities, our, our board, our, in terms of our, our operations, our um, strategic planning and, and related uh, activities. We do, as a matter of course, work uh, very closely with the with the county and through the executive and a number of departments on a range of different projects that interrelate where we have a range of health and social services that that uh, that uh, are important to to think about together mr. chairman director how many members are on your board and how are they appointed there are five members on our board the board members are appointed by the district advisory council which is comprised of the village and township mayors in the community and this is ohio revised code that was written in 1919 so uh so the village and township mayors convene every march um, in every general health district in the state 
they appoint the members and then the county executive is, is a part of that committee. Uh, and they appoint them to five year staggered terms. So they, they are, uh, uh, people have interest in public health, people who have interest in service, and uh, that appointment takes place every March. And Mr. Chairman, Director, what is the annual operating budget of the Health Department and what are the revenue sources that that money comes from? The annual operating budget is about $22 million. Uh, about 13% uh, uh, of those dollars come from the cities that we serve. Uh, we cost about uh, $4.12 $4 .12 per capita. So every citizen pays $4.12 a year for our services, which I would dare say I think is a bargain. Um, we um, receive a, a range of, of, of dollars through permits and fees. We have a, 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 but we're about half grants, our total budget. And of the half grants, about 75% of those grant dollars are federal dollars. We've seen a decreasing... Uh, number of dollars that are direct state dollars that have been it's been happening over the last 15 to 20 years So something less than 6% of our budget comes directly from the state most of it is flow through dollars So uh, in a range of other local uh, philanthropic um, uh, um, Community dollars and uh, and as I said 75% from the feds And uh, As regards the agreement that's the subject of today's legislation, uh, uh, how much does the county pay and how much does the health department pay toward the uh, costs that are involved in, in this right. agreement? At this point, um, speaking with our uh, 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 chief fiscal officer yesterday, the the costs, we are at um, the, uh, the current $275,000, we exceed that in terms of our operation costs annually from the dollars that come from the county. That is for uh, building maintenance, that is for utilities, um, all the, uh, the internet access, phones, uh, general maintenance of the facility. And so, so the idea here from a sharing uh, standpoint is that um, by extending this contract, that would basically be a 50-50 split because it actually it'd be a little bit uh, more on our end because the, the overall cost for the payment of the loan will be about $360,000 on average over the course of 20 years annually. So did I hear correctly that under this agreement that the county will pay $275,000 a year? So under the existing agreement, the uh, current amount is $275,000 a year. The agreement was set in 2003 that every five years, starting in uh, uh, 2004, that the contract would increase by 5% every five years. So it would continue to do that through 2038 every five years. Currently, it's at $275,000. So I presume this is an item that's annually appropriated in the county's budget. Is that correct? Mike Chambers of Public Works, that is correct. We are annually appropriated, and right now for 18, it is the 275, then starting in 2019, it's going to go up to 289. That's the 5% increase, and it is annually general fund supported. And uh, is there any other annual general fund support of the health department, or is it limited to this item? This is the only one I'm aware of that runs through Public Works. Okay. And... Uh, Final thing, uh, could you send us a copy of the slide presentation? Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, to Mr. Chamber, what was the amount, the 5%, 289 next year? Uh, starting next year, January of 19, it's going to be 289,400. Okay. And that runs for five years. And then in 2024, it's going to jump to 303,870 for five years. Five percent. Okay. All right. And I know Miss Baker had a had a question. Yes, and just to get a better understanding, the 2004 to 2023 that was a five million dollar loan. Do I understand that correctly? That will be run down by 2023. So the loan we just took out was this year for 2018 for the building. Um, uh, okay. Project cost. So that'll run to 2038. So this is a request to extend the existing agreement through the life of the loan. So the loan that was ending 2023, are those funds exhausted? Right, that loan, we, we own the building now. Okay. Yes. I'm sorry, I misunderstood, I'm sorry. Yeah. 
And uh, what, what's the physical address of the building? It is uh, uh, 5550 Venture Drive uh, in Parma Commerce Park, right where West 130th T's in Tahoe. Right, right, okay. Mr. Chairman? Mr. Miller. One other question. Uh, because of the uh, 2118 uh, start date on the change in scope, is, is there any need that we pass this item under second reading suspension? Well, I, I, from from um, our standpoint, um, you know, the work is underway and the costs are incurred. Um, uh, you, you have your procedure and we will defer to your procedure uh, as appropriate. Okay. Uh, anything further? I think we would prefer it if you could. Okay. Mr. Chair. All right. Mr. Miller. I think it's... Uh, uncomfortable to have it sitting that long without being in effect. I'm going to make a motion that we favorably refer. Resolution 2018-0085 with a recommendation to leadership to put it on for second reading suspension. Okay, I'll second that motion. Um, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay, the ayes have it. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Council. Okay, thank you. I name at it. Okay, we'll add Ms. Conwell's name, and I'll add my name as well on that. Anybody else? Or good. Okay. <clears throat> With that, uh, next uh, item. Resolution number 2018-0084, making an award on requisition number 42445 to a supplier to be determined in the amount estimated not to exceed $3,922,000 for electric power service services for various county buildings. Okay, if we could have uh, your, your name and explanation for, of this resolution. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Matt Reimer representing the Department of Public Works. And this resolution seeks uh, the authority to make an award for electric power services for various county buildings for a three-year period beginning May of this year. Um, and uh, this is to replace an existing power supplier contract that is expiring at the same time. Okay. Uh, electric power is a complex uh, market, and as such, the county, back in 2015, entered into an agreement with the County Commissioners Association of Ohio Service Corporation for their electricity purchase program. Uh, the manager of the CCO oh. Service Corporation program is Palmer Energy. And with that, we have Mr. Mark Fry, president of Palmer Energy, that will provide an overview of this solicitation process, uh, the results, and the process moving forward to reach an award with a uh, supplier. Okay, thank you. Good morning, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of council. I appreciate the opportunity to speak before you today. Um, just a little bit of uh, fundamental background in regards to the, the purchase of electricity. About uh, 17, 18 years ago, uh, the state legislature decided to allow for the deregulation of the generation purchase of electricity. Most of you are already well aware of that, but uh, but, but in case you're not, so um, that was done in, in what's called uh, Senate Bill 3. It was passed in 1999 by the, uh, by the state of Ohio, and that allowed for, the, for that uh, deregulation. So the third-party purchase of electricity has been around for a number of years. The distribution of electricity through the local wires and, and, and uh, the, the transmission lines are either federally or uh, state regulated by the Public Utilities Commission of Ohio. So what we're talking about here today is the acquisition of electricity uh, from various third-party providers. Uh, I'm the president of Palmer Energy and, uh, and working through the County Commissioners Association as your energy consultant on behalf of this process. So um, the current contract that, uh, that is already in force and is about ready to expire um, it was a, a, for a period of 32 months with an organization a supplier by the name of AEP Energy. Um, some of you were on this uh, uh, this committee back then, and uh, at the time, we uh, indicated there was going to be savings. In fact, the savings has, according to our projections through the end of the contract, uh, about uh, of about $1.1 million versus the prior contract pricing. So uh, substantial savings has, has been experienced. Uh, the county uh, asked us to work through another RFP process. Uh, we sent our RFPs to multiple suppliers, and we came back to one, uh, through an analytical process evaluating the various offers 
and uh, and we're glad to report that the price of electricity has declined uh, since then, and uh, we were able to secure lower pricing on behalf of the, the county facilities that were included in the RFP. So the savings below the current price is, is expected to be, if you uh, keep it at the same 75% uh, renewable component, a level of about $125,000 a year at the current supplier. And the good news associated with that is the lowest cost provider in the initial RFP process. Uh, we've got two potential vendors here that we've uh, we've recommended shortlisting, but the, the lowest po pr uh, price provider would have the same uh, same number by going from 75% to 100%. So the good news is for the county, if they um, choose to move to 100%, the premium, at least in the original proposal by Dynergy, would be no incremental cost to the county. Okay. Uh, and just to committee members, just so you know, um, we will have a substitute at the council meeting once we have a selected vendor since the refresh rate is going to be actually the date of the council meeting. We'll have a substitution up, up here. So just so you know that going forward. Yeah. Okay. Any questions? Okay. Um, with that then. Um, I have a question. Yeah, okay, Mr. Miller. My question is uh, whether the undertaking we're, we're doing with the uh, wind turbine project and the uh, and the solar array uh, whether that has any impact on this project. Okay. Yeah. Um, Councilman, as far as I know, no, because these. Uh, facilities that were in this uh, this process were the remaining facilities after uh, after those uh, changes uh, that in that transition is uh, is underway and occurring. So that this is the other the county facilities that aren't on so CPP. These are the facilities that are not on that uh, on that deal. That is correct. Okay, fine. All right, uh, and with that, we'll have to do an amendment to the uh, resolution 0084, uh, changing the date from April 25th to April 24th. That will be act the actual date of the, the council meeting. This way, it'll allow them to actually uh, send out the uh, contract that day and get that refresh date that day in advance. So, uh, if I could have a motion to uh, amend uh, the uh, resolution number 2018-0084 from April 25th to April 24th, 2018. Some Okay, I have a motion to second. All those in favor say aye for the amendment. Aye. 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 Okay, the ayes have it. Uh, if with, there's no any further questions with that, um, we'll have a um, motion to um, for second reading suspension. So moved. Okay. Second. I have a motion and a, I'm sorry, Mr. Miller. Second. Oh, okay, we have a motion and a second for second reading suspension. All those in I favor. I have a question. Okay, you have a question. It, it's technical in nature. It, it's uh, we changed the start date to 4-24-18. Is there any need to change the end date so it matches up to an exact year year time frame? Okay. Um, we have Mr. Uh, uh, McAleer coming up here to explain this here. Hi, Mr. Chair. Trevor McAleer, County Council staff. Uh, to Councilman Miller's question, we didn't change the start date to the 24th. In the resolution, we changed the refresh date. So that is the day that the electric companies will get the pricing to oh. Palmer. Uh, the start and end date stays the same, but we changed the refresh date to April 24th instead of April 25th. Okay. Okay. I appreciate that. Thank you. Good question. Okay. Uh, with that, then, we'll do a motion for second reading suspension. And second, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. The ayes have it. Okay. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Okay. Uh, Madam Clerk. We're moving along here to resolution number, I'm sorry, um, you, well, you tell me. <laughs> um, resolution number 2018-0082, authorizing an amendment to contract number CE0800729 with the Primer Investment Company for lease of approximately 128 parking spaces located at 4209-4213 and 4415 Euclid Avenue, Cleveland. Okay. For the name for the record? John Myers from the Department of Public Works. Okay, Mr. Myers, if you could explain this resolution here. Sure. Oh, okay. I think you might have this. Yeah. Oh, okay. You received that. Thank you. <laughs> You've seen this uh, uh, picture before. This uh, relates to <clears throat> two uh, 
primarily to our Children and Family Services offices at 40th and Euclid. Mm -hmm. um, as part of, as we've explained in the past, as part of their jobs, our frontline staff use their own vehicles to go out and make house visits and uh, do their, essentially do their job and need places to park coming in and going uh, each day. So um, this on the map in front of you um, is essentially lot number three. Um, and which is owned by Primer Investments. And uh, we've been leasing this space, and um, the time has come to renew that and have a continuing need to um, require this space for the programmatic needs of the Department of Children and Family Services. We are seeking this as a five-year um, lease for 128 spaces. Um, that runs through April 30th, 2023. Okay, uh, any questions from my colleagues? Ms. Uh, Conwell? I'll do the chair to Mr. Myers. I, I thought you guys were not that long ago in front of us in regards to these parking spaces and that we were, when we uh, were aligning the leases, we were mm -hmm. trying to get them all aligned around the same time to end. Well, that's not, uh, <coughs> there are multiple different owners, so we're, we're not, able to dictate that and we've entered and expanded them at different points. So um, in some ways, frankly, we're better off uh, not having them all on the same day because we're in a vulnerable position here because we have uh, a requirement of over 600 spaces um, for this area. And if any one lease ended, we would be in a difficult situation. So that's why in the, uh, Last year, I came to you, uh, Public Works came to you to purchase what is labeled number five on Chester Avenue. So we successfully completed that purchase. So the goal was to start yeah. to try and control some of these spaces so that we weren't at the whims or mercy of any individual landlord. So that's been accomplished and effectuated and being redeveloped for parking. Uh, in addition, I'm here also today uh, on behalf of Public Works to argue um, for lot number six. So there are two of these um, uh, six different areas that service parking that we'll be talking about today, but this is this was to give you an overview so you could see where these, these fit in. Okay. So I do remember that conversation. <clears throat> so uh, six we have not purchased yet. No, that's uh, on the agenda uh, this morning. Five this is morning. not um, suitable Five. for parking yet. But no, we're working on uh, it. We're, we're in the process, hopefully shortly, of letting the contract for that to be redeveloped. Okay, and these other parking structures we're leasing at the moment. Correct, except for number one, which is uh, immediately north uh, adjacent to Jane Edda Hunter, that's, uh, that we own and control okay. currently. So we would one, five, and six, future, hopefully. Hopefully, that would be our plan to start to at least have at least some base number uh, under our control or uh, more solid control so that we're not exposed uh, because there really are not many options in this neighborhood and Midtown is, is a, a hot real estate market and a growing market and um, we um, have, uh, have continued uh, great parking needs for the programmatic uh, needs of uh, children and family services. So with the one, five, and six, <clears throat> when it's up and running, we still would need two, three, and four. Correct. Okay, thank you. Quick question on the uh, total price. Uh, the 415, is that yes. for the five-year term? Correct. Okay, just want to clarify that. So it, it roughly breaks down to, for, uh, for this coming year, then it would be about $49 per parking space. Okay. Okay, Mr. Miller. How does the rate compare with the rate that we were paying for the previous time period? It's about 4.9% higher. Uh, so we're paying, currently paying about 45 per spot. So they're- um, So uh, it's a one-time increase, but the price is good for the whole five years, or is no. there- there are, there are increases each each year over, mm -hmm. uh, except uh, four and five, they're static. Um, this reflects the, as I said, the increasing market of, uh, growing market of this area and the fact that there are 
not really many other options. If you can notice uh, directly across from Jane Edna Hunter on the bottom is uh, our sewer district. Uh, to the right is the Centers for Children and Family, um, which has a large presence. And then directly to the left, if you're looking at the picture, or east of Jane Edna Hunter is the new Children's Museum, which is, um, has its own parking needs, obviously, to meet their, their requirements. So um, the third district recently, about two years ago, opened on Chester here to the east of our um, of five and six lots. Uh, obviously, you're aware of um, our occupancy and build out of the archives building at 40th and Perkins. So there's really a shrinking market right here that uh, is increasing its value. We've had the luxury in the past of not having much competition, but uh, now all these different agencies. Uh, there's a school immediately at 40th and Chester, so the the demand uh, for parking is uh, significantly increasing. And uh, does this agreement provide for any extensions? No, nope, this is just a one five-year uh, plan. Uh, this is with Primer Investments, who owns three and four. Um, the um, goal has been they own the property immediately to the right on the picture, to the east uh, for redevelopment. They own other uh, properties on Euclid Avenue that they've tried to make an investment. Uh, was stalled during this more recent uh, recession, deep recession we've been in, but now we're trying to uh, further look for investments in this in this uh, site that we currently lease. So they're not willing to go any further than that right now and um, to keep their options open for their own uh, purposes as the owner of this property for development. And uh, why is why is the cost for these parking spaces uh, Considerably more than than for for property number six in the, in the next resolution, which is only three hundred and sixty seven thousand dollars for for essentially the same number of parking yeah. spaces. Good question. Two two couple reasons. Uh, this uh, were three is that was the subject here. This is the old, uh, I believe this is the old Cleveland Arena site. So it was uh, has been vacant for quite some time. But as I said. Uh, it's Euclid Avenue frontage, essentially. It's the health line, it's Euclid Avenue frontage, it's, it's a whole different thing. The number six is back on Perkins, which is uh, you know, commercially and otherwise just a location significantly different. Secondly, because we uh, are looking at purchasing that property, was successful, they weren't as motivated about increasing with the uh, CPI or inflation or other things because um, we've, we've tried to indicate our hope to be able to acquire ownership of that. So their motivations were different and they're in a, a different place that doesn't have the same pressure and demand. And uh, how much did we pay to acquire parcel number five? Uh, 319000 So uh, So we would... We would pay more than that over ten years, probably. So, if we were leasing, so I think e easily. Uh, I think, Mr. The, Chairman uh, of the Councilman, yes. I think the economics are pretty good on that. Yes, and the, I think they 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 advocate for our our ownership. Um, it's it, it, but more importantly, because of the increasing development in the area, w we may have no options for this parking need, which is critical to the current service delivery model that. Children and Family Services offers. Okay, all right. Uh, any further questions on? Oh, I'm sorry, Ms. Conwell does. Okay, through the chair to Mr. Myers. So on the map six and five, what is that? It looks like parking structures there. What is, what is that there? Uh, no, those are both that? open land. Uh, oh, on five and six. No, no, open okay. land. That that little. She's talking space about the, the bottom left number, corner. But not number between now. Uh, between five and six. Yeah, that's the uh, PNC, former oh, National City PNC. Bank branch, and then that's their parking surrounding okay. them to that's service their, their bank there. Okay, so okay. we can't get that, of course. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Because I was just thinking of all the lease costs. Yes. You know, it'd be cheaper maybe to do a three-level 
parking garage and get out all those leases. But, I, you know, I, I don't know if you guys have looked at that. Um, we have not looked priced uh, parking structures, but um, in the past, I'm just happy that uh, I, I have the authority to go and try and negotiate and look at this purchase. In the past, we've uh, not been encouraged to seek ownership. So I'm, I'm happy that we've moved at, in this direction uh, more for those two reasons, economics as well as just being able to control our own destiny. Michael Deborah with the Department of Public Works. You know, that's an option that we may be considering in the near future here. So we're, we're aware of that. Um, just getting these few lots under control for the next five years is important to us. But to turn around and put a, uh, possibly a deck up in the future, it'll probably take us two years to get approval from council here. So we're looking ahead, but we haven't made any commitments to that yet. Okay. All right. And I, Good I, questions. My dad, the, the owner of three and four, Gordon Primer, uh, in, as part of his development, has has indicated willingness to work with us. Um, should he be successful in landing a larger investment here, that he realizes the importance of parking and would want to work with us. Uh, obviously, still in a landlord situation, but um, that's still a possibility. But then we lose parking, you know, during the development of that. So that's why we're we're here trying to seek your uh, blessing to try and continue to nail down stronger control okay um, still I still trying to get my head around why why the 4.9 percent increase I mean if it's it's a pretty good deal for the landlord too don't you think I don't know who else would be leasing it, it, these spaces it, it is uh, they were seeking more mm, for, obviously okay. frankly um, as I said it, it's a it's a, a factor of uh, competing needs they have other people who are seeking uh, parking for uh, that area such as the regional sewer district leases the front of it okay. um, and uh, the Center for Families uh, also leases other parking they have as well as their continued investment in the building next door um, and other in, in, so it's it's a market driven issue uh, okay. and is frankly market appropriate for a monthly parking rate okay Okay, with that, um, I, I, you're looking for this on second reading suspension, I'm imagining. We would appreciate your consideration. Okay, uh, could I have a motion? So moved. Okay, we have a motion for second reading suspension and a second on 2018-0082. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed nay. Okay, the ayes have it. And you were mentioning this uh, second piece is almost a companion yes, uh, type. Yes, Cleveland Commerce, which is uh, on your map, the lot uh, number six, where we've had a you, lot you know, of think I think the clerk has to formally sorry, read it. That's OK. Resolution right. number 2018-0083, authorizing an amendment to contract number CE08-00492 with Cleveland Commerce Center for lease of approximately 125 parking spaces located at East 40th Street and Perkins Avenue, Cleveland. Just repeat it again. Yeah, that's right. Again, uh, Mr. Chairman, um, this is on your visual number, lot number six, um, which we have now, um, the lease was expiring uh, May 1st, so we're here to negotiate. Uh, the document before you is a lease amendment to continue this for another five years in uh, the, uh, the total that you see in your, um, in your resolution of $364,000, I believe. So, um, but the, the goal that we've um, um, tried to do, though, is as part of this, we were successful in negotiating a purchase option. Um, we had wanted to purchase, come before you today with a purchase for this site, uh, but as it ended up, we're here with um, a lease amendment, but with a defined purchase option. Okay. Okay, um, it's kind of along the lines we've been talking about. So, uh, any questions from my colleagues on this, Mr. Miller? Just to follow up on that, can you uh, explain the purchase option and how it it interacts with the lease agreement? Yes, um, uh, the the lease is is spelled out there for the next five years, uh, starting in in May. Essentially, any time after the first of next year, we would be free to pull the trigger and purchase it uh, 
for the negotiated pre-negotiated price of two hundred seventy-five thousand dollars. Any other questions? It sounds like something that when the date comes, you're going to want to do. We're going to be lining up. Unfortunately, uh, we tried to purchase it this year, but uh, um, we weren't supported in the purchase, so we came back with this as the next best option to do the lease amendment with the ability to purchase at an early date. It's a very viable option. We, th we, we think so, and are, yeah. as I said, looking to to move this in that direction so we can control some of our own destiny. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, any other questions? Okay, seeing none, again, uh, the time frame on this, I, I'm assuming you want to move this along as well. We'd appreciate your consideration, Mr. Move, Chairman. Move for approval with recommendation on second reading suspension. Okay, we have a motion. Could I have a second? Okay, we have a motion and a second for second reading suspension. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed nay. Ayes have it. All right, thank you. And then, uh, Madam Clerk, if you could read the final uh, resol resolution. Yeah. Resolution number 2018-0087, authorizing an amendment to contract number CE06-00807 with Maple Heights Commerce II for lease of space located at 21100 South Cape Park Boulevard, Maple Heights. Okay. <clears throat> Mr. Myers, if you could, uh, ex an explanation of this resolution. Sure. Uh, we're here on behalf of... Uh, Juvenile court in this case, we've had uh, juvenile court has has multiple satellite um, locations throughout the county in order to facilitate their work with um, the kids that come across their path, right. connect them with community services, and uh, follow up on their probationary requirements. Um, for that reason, uh, the court has uh, consolidated some uh, uh, of these offices in the past. They have had a. a location at Southgate uh, for over 20 years and so there's been a long uh, time uh, presence in the community. Uh, this lease with Maple Heights Commerce was one lease that historically uh, had two agencies in this building, both the juvenile court and pro probation office and the Southgate auto title or Southeast auto title. Um, so we were uh, here uh, to leave um, or change the, the lease to amend it for an additional time. Has sort of a convoluted history to get to you today. Um, at the time, given those two different agencies, uh, w there was an effort on, uh, from the auto title office to, co to singularly locate uh, the Board of Motor Vehicles, the License Bureau, and the Title Bureau in one location. Public Works in the past have been successful in co-locating them. Uh, both at North Olmsted and Parma and Golden Gate. This was sort of the last one that did not uh, meet that, um, that goal since the public is used to dealing with, doesn't distinguish between those, the state and the county and the license bureau. So uh, a, a good goal, but it was taking it to a new level where we were going to be the landlord for those. As it ended up, it didn't... Uh, it didn't work out this, with the state at this point, even though there's still ongoing efforts to try and reach this logical conclusion. At that time, uh, the landlord at this location uh, was aware of efforts to move the auto title, and as part of their ongoing efforts, the building had been empty other than the first floor usage. This is a former medical uh, office building at Southgate Shopping Center. Um, they were successful in landing a large uh, national tenant that took up the entire building and needed a first floor space. So essentially, they refused to uh, extend the auto title. We uh, were forced then to scramble and have temporary situation, which is in place now at the board of the state's uh, Broadway Avenue location. So uh, achieved that co-location, but uh, it's not ideal working conditions, and we continued to work with uh, the auto title to work on a, a, a permanent solution for that. But in the meantime, um, the, the building was sold um, to a national um, uh, landlord who came in and wasn't, uh, when they kicked out the auto title, wasn't <laughs> sure if uh, they wanted to keep the um, juvenile court. 
So we uh, were up against it and, would, and refused to really give us an answer. So after some time, we began to look for an alternative space um, and were faced with the realization of additional movie costs and probably a couple hundred thousand dollars um, of funds to build out a new space. So um, we had a landlord who wasn't kicking us out, but wasn't signing a document. So when um, we continued to hold on, uh, pursuant to the lease approved historically, there is a holdover clause. We continued to be there in the interest of not disrupting the court's program and in the interest of costs so that we wouldn't incur those additional moving costs and uh, the, the, the build-out costs from any new new move with the hopes that we would be able to come to terms with them, which after a long and back and forth and torturous route, we're finally able to do that we're presenting to you today. Okay. Um, you know, looking at this legislation, I see there's a, um, there's two amounts here, and it's my understanding that uh, this took 15 months to yes. uh, well, behind schedule. You were behind schedule 15 months. I mean, that's a that's a long time to be behind schedule. Um, so, w w what, it, what? Why is that? Well, I, I, I had sort of laid the foundation there. We had, uh, but why not pay month to month? Well, what? we 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 have paid in for 2017 because those funds were budgeted in the approved uh, budget, but. We didn't have authority beyond that other than the clause. So the monies weren't there. So that's why we're coming here to come back to you to. So have but the it's my understanding, it's my understanding that there was a check issued in December, though, for an yes. amount, a large amount. Well, for the holdover period at that time, the 11 months, which is referenced in the contract, from essentially when the lease ended in March through the end of the year. So who issued the check there? Because I don't think this body did. Yep. Uh, Mike Chambers of Public Works, as John indicated, the initial agreement had the holdover clause. So the, the legality was you had the holdover clause that was in there. Um, the 2018 budget had the funding already approved by council in the juvenile courts. So um, no check was issued. A check was cut. Okay. The check was issued because at the same time we were being threatened with eviction. We had occupied that space. We owed them the utilities. So the, the, check, the incentive was we're getting into December. They shut down the financial systems. If we didn't cut Well, my, my down, question, let me just back up ahead. a second, Mr. Jammer. So my question is, is if a, cut was, a check was cut, in order for a check to be cut, I mean, don't, the, again, doesn't have to go through getting approved by, by this body? Or? First off, uh, two things. We'll back up. This is not the ideal situation. I think no, I've, it's only, not. I've only had to do no. this thing maybe twice in my 20-something years. Okay. But, we did confer with law. We did have we, we brainstormed on this one. The, do you have the, Do you have a legal opinion from the law? The Legal authority was the the month to month that was in the contract. I know I understand the yeah. contractual but from the that end, but from from a procedural standpoint with the county, did you guys get an opinion from the law department? The the opinion was we owed the money. Okay, so that's the opinion we owed them, and legally we through the agreement we the landlord expected it. They approved it. It was month to month. They expected those checks monthly to continue. We didn't pay them monthly because at the same time, John was trying to get them to sign documents. So we were holding that as an incentive, but then it got to the point where we were at the end of the year, where if we didn't do something, we didn't want the doors to get locked, we didn't want to get evicted. And in fact, we did get the eviction notice maybe a couple of weeks ago, which is when we finally released the check. So that check was not released until... Uh, we, had, we had them sign the So if you, if you had legal authority to cut the check, why do you need us to reaffirm the additional sixty-one thousand? We're, we're definitely documenting everything that happened. It's not a normal process. You know, the holdover clause is in there. There's been a lot of this discussion in the past about what the holdover clause means. It doesn't mean, but it was clearly put in there for a reason to help us in situations like this where you, you know, you have to hold over. So this is just an abundance of caution to document everything went on. Uh, in my humble opinion, I think that's what we're trying to do is, is make sure. It's not an ideal situation. We didn't, you know, this is not how we wanted to do this thing. So with all the issues we've had with internal auditing and going back and, I mean, again, the 15 months back, and then we're supposed to just authorize the six, 61,000 in addition to, I, I understand the 332,365. I understand that moving forward. Um, but, I mean, I'd like some 
legal authority saying that it's okay to move forward with that additional 61897. And, and, and I understand what you're saying. Like I said, it's, it's not the normal way of doing business, but when that initial agreement was authored, that holdover clause was put in there. That was was there. That, well, that was your legal authority because we were not out. Well, that no, that's pay. that's. I understand it from yeah. <clears throat> the lease point of view. I understand yeah. it from a, a contractual point of view with the lease. I'm talking about from a county perspective, from from this body, working through the proper channels, doing things properly. Before we authorize sixty one thousand eight ninety seven, I'm not saying that we couldn't or shouldn't do it. I would just like some legal authority saying that. It's permissible to do. So, if I may, Mr. Chairman, so um, the law, law department, this I wasn't personally involved in this, but okay. it's, it's my understanding that the law department was consulted before this check was cut, and they have uh, okayed that expenditure. Okay, and so could I order, get that? In order to, to yeah. look at this, I think that we need to look at the totality of the circumstances. Obviously, this is not optimal. We all agree on that. Right. But and I think that we have a combination between the legal authority that is offered by the holdover clause in the lease. Then we have the authority uh, given by council for the budget that was approved, including that this particular expenditure on behalf of uh, the juvenile court. And then the obligation, the legal obligation, which is outside the contract, to pay for a service that we're using during this time. So if this is from a legal standpoint, okay. so that's did, how it gets did, us there. Did the lease? Did it, did it follow all the right processes? Obviously. Right. I can answer that. Did the did the last lease amendment did it include a not to exceed clause in it? And if so, did it contemplate the holdover for the rent payments in it? John, you want to speak to that? It, I don't. I don't remember honestly. You know, the, the you could, this was five, five, six over six years ago. I don't. Well, because because if not, then I don't think there's legal authority there to to do that. If there's a n do not exceed clause in there. Well, uh, there is. You know, just it's like, even if it's budgeted. Yeah, I understand, uh, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. And as I said, I all I can do is say we're trying to do the best thing for ultimately for the county here, and it, it, we could probably look at things to do additionally or differently. But I have full confidence that we were trying to do what was in the best interest. In in addition to the additional layer, the Southgate Neighborhood Family Service Center had just pulled 85 FTEs, as well as the auto title, another 15. So. We had just pulled out another 100 FTs from Maple Heights. Uh, we were trying to keep our presence there, save the county money, and proceed in a, in a fashion to continue to meet the program requirements that, of this office. Yeah, I would, I would just think after so, so many months, it might be something that you guys should have brought up before this body, before we got to this point. We didn't have a vehicle to, to officially do that. We, didn't, we had a landlord that had not signed a document until just recently. So that's why we're here. The funds that were, were presented were only from fiscal year 2017. We have not done that for 2018. And we're recognizing that, as, uh, as Mike said, in the abundance of caution to, to, uh, to do that. So I, it's, uh, I appreciate the situation and the difficult and awkwardness of the ask, but trying to do the right thing, unfortunately, um, the options were to move out of there and abruptly and have the program suspended and to expend a couple hundred thousand dollars extra to come back to you to spend um, for build out and moving costs. Um, Mr. Miller? Uh, Mr. Myers, oh, yes. how does yeah. how does the uh, cost going forward compare with what we've been paying? It's a, a, a modest increase, uh, Mr. Mr. Miller, Mr. Chairman, to, to uh, Councilman Miller, uh, approximately in the three or four percent range. Um, we've tried to keep the cost. This is another d difficulty we have. We we throw a lot into our lease. This is not a standard triple net lease that we try and do. The landlord has to pay the taxes, mm. do the cleaning, the common area maintenance, all those things we try and envelope into this base rate. So, And are there annual escalations? There is uh, a, a modest, uh, modest annual escalations, yes. OK. Uh, my, my general comment is that uh, that I think the administration has served us well in this matter under difficult circumstances trying to work with this, this landlord. And, 
And unless we, uh, un unless we, I'm not an attorney, so my un unless we uh, identify some some specific and identifiable legal impediment, you know, I think I would be inclined to support it. Well, okay, I appreciate your comments, Mr. Miller. I'm, again, I don't know that it goes to the the contractual issue between the county and the landlord that I'm concerned about. I'm concerned about what it. The, the procedure here, just doing things the right way. And I just would feel more comfortable uh, from the assistant law director if we had a written legal opinion saying you guys had authority to do what you had you did and it worked out okay and we can authorize moving forward with the funding. I don't see, it's been 15 months. I mean, if you hold this thing another week or two, I don't know what the impediment would be if there's legal authority to, to do that. So that's what I'm gonna ask the law department to do in this instance. Mr. Uh, Ms. Conwell. Mr. Chair, can they, uh, if they agree to get the written explanation, can we move it out and, and they get it to us before we vote on it in council? Uh, that way it's not holding up the process. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm okay with, with doing that. I'm okay with doing that. It, we'll have, uh, uh, as long as we get that before a, a vote on this. So with that, Ms. Ms. Uh, Baker. Yeah, and I'm, I'm trying to follow. <laughs> The, the long story. So the 61897, that's for 15 months, did you say? Am I under, understanding that? Uh, Mr. Chairman to Councilwoman Baker, no, that's for the 11 months. 11 so months. only, we didn't do anything other than what was in the, what was budgeted for 2017 in order to forestall being evicted or to, to continue to work with the landlord to get to this point of getting a signed document to achieve what we were trying to achieve. If I may, the holdover, how many months in the contract were we able to continue that? It did not specify a limitation to our ability. So um, you, we could have held over for, I mean, the, the purpose, how long could we have? It, I think it's been I, it, 15, it, it, right? It, it, it's it's, it's a, a fair question. The, generally, the purpose of a holdover clause is to incentivize the, the conclusion of it so that we, usually there's a higher rate being paid in a, in a prescribed holdover clause so that normally it's, you know, something that only takes, you know, a couple of months or something that it would be under consideration right. to incentivize the tenant, in this case us, to make sure that, and, uh, that the issue is resolved. Okay. Any, any follow-up? Um, yes. Is... Was there any concern in that holdover? Hmm. So there was no increase in, the, in this particular holdover. We could have gone on. There was a, a, approximately a 3% increase, yes. To hold over each month. Yes. Okay. That's included in the 61. Correct. And the 61 also included the utilities for that period of time as well. So we held, was so the we, agreement prior including utilities? Well, we have a, um, the lease provides for we have a, we have to pay our electrical bill essentially there. So this one check was to fold it into a, a one lump sum so that there was just one check being cut given the, the length of time involved here. So the landlord paid for the utilities until this? Prior, yes. Okay. Okay. Um, so with with that, um, we'll we'll move this along here. Um, we will do this on uh, sec. Well, second, second reading. So, okay. Well, yeah, we're behind anyway. So, okay. Well, it's going to be second reading suspension contingent on getting a. Uh, an opinion from the law department um, regarding that additional uh, 61897.90 um, authority to authorize that. Um, yeah, and it, uh, you can tell I mean, we're not pleased with you know the way this turned out, and hopefully moving forward we can we can uh, learn from this. So, okay, I uh, hope you can appreciate our concern up here. So. We, we hear you loud and clear, okay. Mr. Chairman, and I appreciate your concerns that are all. Very legitimate. I okay. tried to let you know uh, how we were trying to deal with the facts presented to us. Okay.
Appreciate it. Okay, uh, is there anything? Uh, well, I have a motion. So moved. And a second. second. Okay, so all those in favor say aye. Aye. Okay, opposed nay, the ayes have it. All right, Madam Clerk, is there uh, any public uh, comment? Uh, no, Mr. Chair. Okay, I'm sorry, <laughs> getting confused. Uh, anything else from members of the committee? Okay, and seeing none, uh, could I have a motion to um, adjourn? So moved. And a second? Yes. Okay, I have a motion and a second to adjourn. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. Aye. Ayes have it.